So how do you use the gear that you're going to have when you get on a high line that's already rigged your first time? This is part four of a seven part video series that corresponds to our Highlining 101 book on slackline.com on how to use a Highline that's already rigged. Now we go into depth on how to use all the gear that you're gonna have in here. In the other first video, we show you what gear to buy. And every video we cover is about the same stuff, but we look at it from a different angle. The last video was about safety and it talks about all the gear we're gonna talk about now, but the safety aspect. Now, if you already know how to highline, please kind of scan through the video, see if you like it, and please share it with somebody who is new so they are more prepared when they go out the first time. And if you're new, welcome to the Slackline community. Please enjoy this comment. We hope this helps you a lot. This is my new studio and lab, and you will see my old studio and my old house in these videos because we did this over a long period of time a while back ago. This was in some tucked away obscure YouTube thing broken out into 80 videos and kind of obnoxious. And now it's on the main channel and in the timeline below, you can see it all broken up into chapters and in the description so you can skip to the part that you want to see. Or if you're new, just watch it through its entirety. We hope you enjoy it and please leave some comments below on what you think and we could potentially make an eighth video to supplement everybody's comments on these seven. Enjoy. Do you know your gear? Your gear has been tested and you may have played with it at home, but I really want to just emphasize one last time that you really, really understand your gear. I know we've covered this a lot, but you want to make sure you understand your harness and you need to understand how your carabiners work. These twist gates here are three ways. You have to lift up, then twist, then open. You should know everything about your gear when you're completely stressed out. You're not gonna be in your living room, playing with it, looking at it and staring at it. You're gonna be for dear life hanging on, trying to figure this out. And you're gonna be like, you'll look, you really will look like this probably. It's kind of fun to watch. And you'll be like, you really need to know your shit before you try to do this up high. It's the whole point of sit starting. Great, you can sit start, but you need to be able to do it when you're in super stressed out. So really, really take the time to go behind your back, figure this out, do it upside down, just practice, 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 one-handed all the time, play with it, play with it while you're driving. No, play with it while other people are driving. Just really, really take the time to understand your gear before, before you go highlining. It's important to know your harness since it is what holds you to the high line. And if this isn't right, it doesn't matter how good your high line is rigged. My harness is a auto locking harness. This is the most important thing you need to know is whether or not your harness is auto locking. All I do is pull this one side and then I'm done. Whereas a double backed harness goes back through. And if you don't do that, it comes undone. So this is, can be very confusing, especially if you borrow somebody's harness and they have a double backed harness and that's a common risk. So mine is auto locking. My leg loops are auto locking. When you get your harness, you should look at the instruction manual, understand how all of it works. In this case, I can take this out, which it has this sewn end on the end there. So it's hard to come out of the first buckle, but it does come out, which is a little unnerving with auto locking but you wanna be able to pull the whole thing apart and put it back together. Sometimes these little supports that hold up the leg loops can come unclipped and that's not a big deal. This is just holding up your leg loops. It's more about a comfort thing than anything else. That's why they're so flimsy. But you wanna know that, that little, how that hook goes on there. You wanna know that your gear loops are not load bearing so you're not clipping vital things to your loops. Whereas some harnesses actually do have load bearing gear loops, which I don't think is necessary. So take the time at home before you go out to a high line to un fully understand your harness and how it keeps you safe. There. Now I can go high lining. My harness is a little bit different. So here I actually have two buckles and they're both double back buckles. 
um, my leg loops are also double backed. You can tell on most harnesses that are double back that they are double back because when it's open, it says danger. And you never want to see that sign that says danger when you're about to go highline. Another cool trick with double back buckles to know is that if this is an O, if you can see the whole buckle as an O, it stands for open. And if you bring it back through and double it back, then you can see that it's a C for closed. The reason this looks so bulky and it has these features is because it is a big wall harness. My harness specifically has two belay loops embedded within each other for redundancy. Belay loops are one of the weakest points on harnesses, so it's nice to have two of them. When you highline, it's nice to feel like you have nothing on. I'm not like that. I like to use this big hefty harness. It's really cushiony. It's fun to sit in. It's nice and comfy. This has two belay loops. I wish that every harness had two belay loops, but this is one of the only ones that does. Uh, it definitely feels safer having redundancy in your harness. This is my harness. It's slightly different because it has an auto locking feature on the belt, whereas the legs are doubled back. This is why it's important to look at your harness and actually know what you're getting into before actually using it in the field. Where do you tie in to your harness? This is called the belay loop, and it is to, you guessed it, belay. If you're gonna use a carabiner to use a belay device to either repel or belay or whatever, it's best to stick it on your belay loop because it pulls on both your leg loops and your waist belt evenly. If you take this carabiner and clip it to your leg loops and your belt loop, it doesn't necessarily pull evenly on your harness. It can try load this carabiner, pulling it in multiple directions and making the carabiner significantly weaker. This I've seen people trying to avoid the belay loop as if it's a dangerous thing. And it's actually a pretty strong thing. It is rated between 15 and 20 kilonewtons and we do brake tests on slack snap for that. This is not how you do this, however, it is where you tie in. It adds a layer of redundancy because you have independently bypassed a single point of failure. Your belay loop doesn't need to fail if you're tied in. You don't want to tie into the belay loop because it also puts your knot further away. It adds wear and tear, unnecessary wear and tear with the, oh, my leash just fell off. Wear and tear with your rope running over a single belay point. It's also why I don't recommend putting a daisy chain directly through your belay loop, even though it's not the end of the world. But in 2006, a famous climber named Todd Skinner died uh, because he used his belay loop like I have right here too much and it wore it out. Ironically, I was there that week when that happened. My first big wall, I came home and someone died. I thought big walling was extremely dangerous when I first started. It's not as dangerous as I thought it was, but there are inherent risks. But because that belay loop incident was so close to home for me, I have avoided using it for anything other than carabiners. So what do you do with your rope? You don't go down, but you go up from the bottom leg loop into the waist belt loop and you follow the exact same thing that the belay loop is in and that way it's grabbing your legs and your waist same time you want to suck up your knot as close to your harness as possible before you start tracing this figure eight which we'll show in another video over the shoulder so you get a better view and i just want to really emphasize where it is supposed to be on your harness you can finish your knot since we are trying to be thorough here with a safety finish Either way, you can see here that I'm tied into legs and waist. You don't want to miss one or the other. People have missed one or the other, and it can either flip you upside down or pull on your waist quite uncomfortably. You want these to both be working together on your harness. Anyways, that is where you tie in to your harness. So let's go over start to finish how you tie in at the cliff. I already have my personal anchor safely keeping me attached to the anchor while I do this. 
since pretty much all leashes are right here near a cliff edge. So leashes are around the anchor. I've got to untie that. And then I move my personal anchor out of the way and put it in my harness in those two points. And I tie my figure eight, which is just half a, half a figure eight right there. And then we trace that. I go over right there, tighten that up. And to check my length to make sure I like where it's at, that looks like it's long enough. And then I tie my last safety knot there. And now these leashes are all standard size, the ones that have this uh, padding over them, the tubular webbing. And so when I have this much tail left over, I know that it's the length that I like. And then I put my tail through the end of there just because that's the way I like it. Keeps my knot nice and tidy. And then I check myself to make sure I don't have anything in my pockets. My harness is correctly attached and tight enough. Everything feels good. I got my hat leash on and my personal anchor. I can pull off, clip like this. But before I go out, I'm gonna ask someone to buddy check me. Hey Kyle, can you clip in and check me real quick? Yeah, I'm all clipped in. So your harness is tight enough. You got Perfect a double there. back. Um, you're through both the tie-in points. Your figure eight looks good. Um, you got your backup knot. The figure eight on the leash rings looks good. Um, you got your hat leash. Yeah, you're my, stoked. My, you're, my you're pockets hydrated. are empty. I'm locked. I'm ready to go. I'm psyched. I'm ready to go. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Have fun. This is how long to make your leash. So everyone has a different length. And every rig you get on is probably going to have a different leash. Um, leashes are usually 12 feet long, but they're not always the same. So what you want to do is you want to make sure you got part of your figure eight tied already. I'm going to go up through my tie-in points. And then now I'm going to hold it here right next to my harness like it's already tied and I'm going to push the leash rings out with my foot and I'm going to make sure I can push it out with my tiptoes so that I can stand it as tall as possible without the leash yanking me down on the line because if you tie this too short you will not be able to stand all the way up. You can also have preferences of how long depending on if it's just big enough for you to stand up it's gonna be hitting the back of your heels, so you want it a little bit longer than that. Some people like it drooping below the line to have it extra long. It's all personal preference, but you at least have to make sure that you can stand up all the way. So use that foot, push it out, get the length. If you, you wanna cinch this figure eight as close to your tie-in points as possible. So you're gonna adjust that beginning part of the figure eight to move those points for you. Check it, it's good. And then finish your figure eight, tie in and have fun. Where do you put your line slide when you're not using it? In my situation, because I have this dog bone from a quick draw that I leave permanently on here, so I can clip it on here and not drop my hangover. I have to and want to naturally clip it to my first gear loop on the side, but there are multiple ways of doing it. My preferred method of where I put my line slide is just right the furthest back gear loop because it keeps it out of my way. Um, some people like to clip two gear loops so that it kind of keeps it even more out of the way. Um, one thing that I do like to do is <clears throat> I'll use this my personal anchor and when I'm ready to line slide somewhere if I'm not if I don't need the efficiency or I'm just resting I'll use this first loop and keep it here and um, when I was first starting I would actually take my auto locker put it on the side and I would just have this on my personal anchor and I would use it as a keeper how do you attach your line slide if you are done eyelining. More often times than not, I like to clip um, my hangover, main and backup, while I'm still sitting on it. 
It's actually a lot easier, I think, having this uh, extender on here. So it's just really what I'm used to. And then um, you wanna keep your leg on here. You don't wanna just shock load it. So you go down gently. And before you mount it, so many times it's like upside down. You wanna make sure that it's right side up before you lower your weight onto it. Once your weight's on it, then you know it's fine. Like it's straight, it's not twisted, and I'm ready to go. Uh, you do want to be mindful of the direction you're going. If I was going that way, I wouldn't want the ring on that side because then it just clank, clings and clinks all the way up. Another way you can do this, if you're hanging underneath, let's say I whipped, fell, and I'm over this shit, right? I could, um, after I'm done climbing my leash, I come over here, usually it's clipped to this side. I can unclip it, pick what side I want, this side or this side. But here you wanna make sure you grab the backup and the main. You can start with the main and then take this backup and clip to it and then put your weight on it. If you need to bypass uh, loops, segments, twists, whatever, all you do is put your heel up here, lift your hips up and lift it up and over things. And that is how you put on your line slide. How do you take off your line slide? Well, you just take it off. It's not really rocket science, but let me show you a few tricks. What you can do is I move it uh, towards my chest and then I mount. So all the stuff is like here and manageable and not like behind me. Once I'm on top, my line slide's just hanging here. I can unclip it, don't drop it. I would have dropped it if it wasn't on this just now and you clip it off to your side. Don't forget to take it off the high line. Two weeks ago, I did this, and I got here, and I stood up as hard as I could, and I wasn't going anywhere. And I started laughing because I realized I never took my line slide off. So make sure that you take your line slide off before you mount and start walking. chee -hoo. What kind of hats do you need for highlining? Well, pretty much anything that blocks the sun would work for you. The size of the hat is not that important, even though you don't want it to come off too easily. It's nice when they have adjustability in the back, but you can also make it really tight, really tight, and this is what I've done in the past, and not use a hat leash. Not only is it uncomfortable to have a super tight hat, some hats can't get super tight, like this one, which has a really, crappy buckle in the back, but I can put a hat leash on this hat, which is pretty important to not uh, litter with hats, which I have lost a few, and it's important to not get your leash tied up around your high line. In order to have a hat leash, you have to basically install the paracord, just three or four millimeter string, paracord, and make sure it's on something secure. Now, when you have a hat leash, you can eliminate a carabiner by just tying the string directly onto your harness. But sometimes I like the flexibility of just having this, girth hitch it on, and then you attach it to your hat. Make sure it is on a secure part of the hat and something that just doesn't come off too easily because about every time you whip, it's probably going to fall off. Now, I'm not too fond of having this string loose and flopping around all over the place with a hat attached to it with highline there. Now, you know, one little seesaw with this isn't necessarily going to hurt your highline, but if it did fall on this side and you were to fall on this side and it would zoo, could damage your webbing. So one option you could do is to do that, stick it down your shirt and then clip it to your harness uh, gear loop. And then when it falls, it's not too far. You just string it back up, pull it over. And that way you don't have a bunch of just loose stuff flying around when you fall off of a high line. So basically any hat is fine, but the super good enough hats are probably the best. Buffs are a nice option when you're high lining. This can help keep your music in your ears, can keep the sweat out of your eyes, which on a hot day can be quite frustrating when you're trying to laser focus while sending a high line. It can keep you warm. It can protect you from the sun. And if you're into blindfold highline walking, then this is actually a really great option uh, that's pretty convenient. 
when you are trying to practice Highline blindfold locking. And of course, if you do have a buff, you can look like you belong to the Colorado or East Coast slacker groups. What colors should you wear when you highline? It's pretty important to have the right colors if you want a photo that's worth sharing. As you can see here, just in the camera right now in this white background gear room, how bad a white shirt looks and a light colored hat and how there's almost no contrast, even with all the gear on the wall. So let's go over a bunch of examples on what not to do and what to do when wearing colors highlining. So you can see here on our first photo, the 960 footer at Taft Point, Jerry Mischewski is wearing green and gray. And you can see how difficult it is to see him, even with this picture that is closer up and with a shadow in the background. It doesn't pop, not like this photo of the same line with Kim on it with all purple. And you can see how where her skin is showing how she completely blends in with El Capitan. If she had a purple jacket on, you would actually see a little bit more of uh, her entire body and it would actually look even better. Kim's purple outfit also looks good with the difficult shot of the wall behind her with the trees and the rock and it pops in the shadow or without a shadow in the background. And her green hat pops as well. You can see Sebastian without his shirt on. He only pops if there is a shadow on the wall and the sun is on him. You can see Jules Camp here in Marseille's Highline over the ocean. He's wearing light gray shorts and no shirt. And you can barely, barely see him. And the same problem here, the no shirt problem, is Andy Lewis walking the Cabo San Lucas super good enough line without a shirt on. And if he was wearing an orange shirt or some other pants that were a little bit more popping, it actually could look a little bit sharper in this photo. Lucas and Freddy have their colors pretty much dialed. Lucas is colorful top and bottom there on the 55 footer on the line. And you can see the difference between the pants Luke Freedy is wearing where it's black bottoms and yellow shirt. And you can see how much of a difference that's popping. Inspired by Lucas, I did get yellow pants and wear an orange shirt here in this photo. And you can see how much more it pops. Now it does kind of look funny when you go out to dinner later that night wearing clown clothes. But if you're gonna go highlining, you want colors. Freedy is doing a handstand on the left and Lucas is on the right and you can see how much more that orange pops and how it can look a lot better in a photo. This is a very difficult shot to get with anything other than bright colors because of how dark and gray and gringy the background is. You can barely see Henry Smith here on this high line where he's wearing the exact same color clothes as the background. You can basically only see his legs. Whereas the exact same photo is with blue and yellow and it pops with such a busy background. Now I'm wearing a yellow jacket and yellow pants because I forgot I had yellow jackets when I bought my yellow pants, but it worked out really well for a photo like this with the sun just hitting me and that whole background being in a shadow. If I was wearing anything dark in this photo, even the sun hitting me wouldn't light me up. Sarah Cochlenberg has a onesie on that's quite colorful here on our line at Heilfosch in Iceland. And then Robert is wearing an Icelandic sweater that's not colorful. And you can see the difference between Sarah's and Robert's clothing in these exact same photos. And if you're going to highlight a glacier line, don't wear dark gray at midnight with dirty ice. You can see the difference between Kim wearing her purple and red clothing versus my black clothing and how much more she pops. Another line we did in Iceland, you can see my green shirt and dark pants are not popping, even with a blue background. It doesn't look nearly as good as Kim's orange pants, and in this case, her white jacket. Now, if she was against the sky, the white jacket could be a problem. So the more you look like a clown when you're highlining, the better your photos will turn out. Doesn't this look better? Let's talk about music management. Not what music you should listen to, but how to manage how to listen to it. I have wired headphones that I typically use. I have seen people use these before, and it seems to be pretty intense to have this on your head while highlining. I don't see it too often. And, uh, 
don't think I'll ever try it. For the wired headphones, I usually have a little tiny MP3 player that are pretty cheap these days. And I just clip it to my leg loop of my harness. It's attached, you know, by the end of this. And so uh, it has fallen off a few times, pretty rare, but it never comes off of this because it's so lightweight. I don't like to have loose wires and everything when I highline on the outside of my clothing. So just like my hat leash, I put this through my shirt and this would clip to my either my phone. I don't typically take my phone because my pants don't have zippers to keep it in there. Otherwise, it would be nice to have that. And then something I've learned, you can just do it this way, but I like to take these little, I don't know how fashionable they are, these little paper, paper clip things, grab it there, and I clip it in place. The one time I did forget this, I lost it on site because it was like pulling on my ears and pulling me down. So I do that and plug in my thing and crank my music and try to have like an MP3 player that has like a hold or something. So like when it gets bumped, it doesn't freaking change your music in the middle of the high line. So this to me is a pretty solid way of doing it. If you are, uh, if you have like a bunch of hair, it's actually kind of nice because usually you like pull it up and bun it up so it doesn't get like stuck in a line slide or something. You can actually take one of those wired Bluetooth ones that just have the short wire that go in between your ears and run it through your hair and then into your ears. And that way it doesn't fall out and it's like super minimal. And, but you do have to have something, I guess, in your pocket when you're highlining for the Bluetooth. So either way, you're gonna have a source and you gotta have something in your ears. The moral of the story is make sure you don't drop anything and make sure it doesn't interfere with your highlining. So you figure out what works best for you, but those are my tips for the music. Hey, thanks for watching, but please do not be an idiot and go highlining your first time without going with someone who knows what they're doing. This video series is just to prepare you and help you have the gear and make it so you can practice before you get that special opportunity to finally go highlighting. If you already highline, please share this with somebody you might take out so they can go through the whole video series so they're fully prepared to get on that line so you don't have to rescue them. It's better for the YouTube algorithm ecosystem for me to release these once a week. So we're gonna do that every Saturday until they are all out. So you don't have to wait until we do that. We're gonna put the unlisted video links in the description below. So you can just blow through all this, look at the textbook and move on with your life. This is a gift economy style of education. I believe it's more important to have this information free and available to everyone than for me to get 20 bucks but it's not free to make. So if you enjoyed the entire course and you read the textbook and you look at the Bolton Bible and watch all of our episodes, spot us 20 bucks. It really helps, 100% goes back on the channel as you can see on our donation page on slackline.com. We're a very open book. And make sure you keep your eye out for the Highlining 102 course. We are gonna completely finish this and the Bolton Bible 2021 version before we finish the Highlining Anchor course but that's gonna be, oh, it's a lot more exciting to make that than this series. So uh, we're pretty excited about what's coming. So make sure you hit that like button and uh, we'll see you at the next video. Cheers.